Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today and wherever you are right now and whether you're listening or watching, we've got a great session um, in store for you. After the success of our previous podcast recording with Stephen Pye of Rock Search and the positive feedback we received from so many recruiters, we decided to do another one. Today's guest has had a hugely successful career in recruitment, starting out in 2005. So that means he's been around for nearly 20 years and has had quite the journey. He's had some phenomenal highs throughout his career and is now the US Group Managing Director for Faden International. For those of you who don't know, Faden started out in 2004, initially in the UK, and they expanded to the US in 2013 and to other countries in between. They've had some incredible successes and the accolades and awards are evidence of that. And for Kieran, he's been instrumental with their US success. And Faden today are cemented as an absolute powerhouse in the marketplace. So Kieran, firstly, hello and thank you so much for agreeing to join us today and share some insights and a bit of your journey with us. Yeah, absolutely. Nice to nice to see you, Amy. Yeah, thank you very much for, for having me on. Excited to hopefully tell people a little bit about my story, Faden's story. Um, yeah, and just give the people a view of what it's been like growing this business across the world and, and in the US. Oh, fantastic. Well, I tell you what, that segues really nicely into what I first wanted to ask you, which is if you could just start by giving all our viewers a little bit of a backstory about you, your recruitment story and how you've ended up as the US Group Managing Director of Aiden International today. Yeah, sure. So um, I think, yeah, obviously joined the business back in 2005. Uh, I've been doing a bit of business to business sales after graduating previous to that and uh, didn't really know much about recruitment or staffing as, as we would call it here. Um, but I was I was looking for more money. Uh, so I, I Googled high paying sales jobs. This thing called recruitment started to appear on, on adverts. And uh, yeah, it was just interesting. You know, they're offering uncapped commission, career progression. And I, yeah, you know, actually through a, a bit of luck, a, a, a rec to rec actually called me and, and, you know, said, I've got this guy who's launched a business. He's looking for his first hire. You know, I think you guys would get along on a personal level. Do you want to meet him? And uh, I said yes. And then I went and met the the founder of Selby Jennings, which was to become Faden yeah. after that, uh, a guy called Adam Buck. And obviously uh, that all went okay because I'm still here today. Uh, so yeah, I kind of, you know, I think like most people fell into it, but um, yeah, had the, I guess, the privilege of joining a business right at the start. I was employee number two. Uh, and it was me, Adam, and another guy kind of on day one uh, in Selby Jennings, we had, I think a handful of candidates, maybe a couple of clients. Uh, back in those days, there was no LinkedIn. My, my, my <laughs> boss at the time used to tell me they would just stop faxing CV. So I missed, <laughs> I missed the fax generation, thank God. But wow. we were, yeah, it was it was a different world, but I think it was an exciting one. You know, we 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 knew what market we wanted to be in. We wanted to be the go to recruiter in, in mid to senior finance recruitment. Um, I had a crash course in recruiting. The training was was very much, you know, here's a phone, here's a computer, um, let's work it out together. And I think, again, thankfully, things are very different these days. But, um, you know, early on, I kind of got into it. And I realized this was a really interesting job. Um, the markets we worked in were interesting. And yeah, as we as we started out, the vision was always to grow and be a growth company. So within sort of eight months, I'd hired my first person, uh, began building teams out. Uh, you know, really up until the financial crisis, I built a pretty good business of sort of 35, 40 people. Um, that hit, and that was my first experience of, of a difficult time in recruitment, yes. for sure. Uh, I remember COVID anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure we'll touch on that later, but yeah, it came out of the tube and, and everyone said, layman's going bust on those newspaper signs. I was like, this is probably not good. Um, so went through that, and then really after the financial crisis, that was when we decided to fade into diversify what we were doing in terms of brand offerings. We, we knew we had a good recruitment model, but we wanted to, I guess, protect ourselves a little bit, but also provide that service to different industries. So that's when we started launching different brands. You know, we have six now. Um, and then, you know, in terms of my role, I actually grew up in Hong Kong. I was born there. So when uh, we were looking at internationalizing, we were doing a good amount of business from London, particularly in Asia and a little bit in the US. That was something that I put my hand up to do. So I led the the opening of offices in Singapore, New York, uh, San Fran, Hong Kong. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we were able to have a pretty good track record of taking people from our head office, launching yeah. on the ground and then building local businesses off the back of that. So from doing that, uh, our founder exited the business, uh, you know, around 2015, 2016. And that was when uh, Harry Utan, who's our CEO now, took yeah. the, the top job. 
he was the guy that I worked with to actually launch the US. He was on the ground for the first couple of years. So we did a bit of a job swap. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you know, when, when, when we started out in 2013 in the US, we were seven people uh, that we brought over from London. You know, now here we are today, 2022, we've got nine, nine offices across the US uh, operating out of eight different states. Uh, we've got 650-ish people as of today. Wow. Um, and yeah, we went past $100 million in, in NFI last year, which was a nice milestone to hit. So uh, yeah. hard to imagine how much has been done in those sort of 17, 18 years. But um, yeah, it's been a wonderful story. You know, as a career, it's given me everything and more that I ever thought it could. And, you know, as a business, I think it's, it's, it's amazing to see that the vision we had at the start, I think, outgrew us, right? And we just, we, we realized even more that, you know, we've always wanted to be about growth, but we could be about growth across different end markets, different geographies. And still keep that DNA of what we feel Faden is, which is fun, entrepreneurial, and somewhere where you can, you know, build a career rather than just have a, a job in recruitment. Yeah. Basically. Wow. So kind of when you joined uh, Ground Zero, employee number yeah. two, as you say, uh, never expected to probably be where you are today and the size of Faden is what it is. Yeah, I think it's always those moments, right? You know, first we get to 20 people and you pinch yourself yeah. and be like, wow, we're, we're really big. Then you get to 50 yeah. and you get to 100. And then, and, you know, to be honest, at some point now, I, I probably don't spend enough time sort of stopping and going, mm. this is pretty impressive. I think one of the great things about us as a business is we don't ever have an end point. We're not like, right, you know, that's a good year. Let's just consolidate. It's always more, more, more. But I do try and again, stop occasionally and go, you know what, this is this is a pretty good yeah. thing to achieve so far. But just kind of in my head and I think in everyone's head is always kind of what's next and, and what's yeah. next after that. That's it and it is important I think especially for anyone in a sales role to kind of just take stock when the going's good and just pat yourselves on the back and recognize kind of how much you have grown how you know how well businesses have done. I know when we spoke last week about doing this podcast together and I was kind of just saying I was in awe of what you guys have done. You were like, oh, really? <laughs> and it's because you just don't take to, don't take the time to take stock of everything that's being achieved. But, you know, you guys have had huge and phenomenal success. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, I, you know, we don't take a lot of time to sort of stop. And I think that is one of the things that is great about our business. Like, it's important to do well and it's important to celebrate success. But again, I think one of the things about our DNA has always been you know, pat yourself on the back for one minute, but then November 1st, when our year starts, we're kind of back to zero. We're expecting to grow 30, 40, 50 yeah. percent. But, you know, I think it, it it takes a lot of effort, both as an individual and as a team to do that. And I think that's one of the, the magic parts of our business that we've always had that commitment to going, right, whatever we achieved last year is just the, the platform for next year rather than a, a kind of, yeah, uh, yeah the, the end goal. But yeah, uh, I do try and pat myself on the back. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Yeah. It's having that energy and motivation, isn't it? To kind of eight o'clock the next day, we go again. Like we can't just carry on, you know, with what we did yesterday. It's a new day. We need to keep plugging away, keep going. First of the month as well. You know, every day it's yeah. just we go again, we go again. So uh, you guys have definitely, you know, done an incredible job of that. So you just said there um, that you've kind of got nine officers across eight states, 650 staff. And we're just going to try and hone in now on kind of that US story that you guys have had. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing with everyone kind of what Faden looked like when you first entered the US market and kind of how you built it up to the size of what it is today. Yeah, so, you know, like I said, we came across with a core team that we had uh, from our kind of hub office in London. We we originally looked at the US as a, as a good financial services market. New York is a financial services hub. We, we were doing some business there, but the logic was if we go there, we might be able to do some more. Um, but, you know, we we didn't know a huge amount about the US call beyond that. So we, we launched with two brands, um, our financial services brand and our supply chain brand. Uh, I think one of the things that we wanted to do from minute one, though, was build an American business. So we initiated straight away pretty much began hiring local people, local graduates, yeah. teaching them the Faden model. And I think, you know, our our view was the more people we can teach how to do it the Faden way, the bigger yes. the business could become. But we also were very adamant that we wanted American people to be part of this. If we were really going to build something that had longevity and legs, it couldn't mm -hmm. just be a British outpost of a company doing some deals in recruitment and kind of, you know, sending the money back home. Yeah. So, um, you yeah, know, that, that was interesting for us. You know, I think there is a definite... Um, difference in, in attitude and culture on some things around hiring and training in the US versus the UK. But I think we worked that out really quickly. And 
you know, if I look at the business we have today, four of the offices we have are run by locally grown uh, American talent that we hired from graduate and put through to that point. And if you look at the second tier management in every office, that is either fully or majority US staff that we brought through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how have we gone about growing? I think, you know, we we looked at how we could continue to deploy different brands. So we've got six brands in the Faden family. Every year we've been in the US, big part of my job is looking at, you know, where are the market opportunities, where are the vertical opportunities, both geographically, but also in terms of, you know, digging deeper into those. The model we've always had is, is you know, go with an organically grown leader and then build around that person. So, you know, I think we would not have been able to achieve what we'd achieved if we'd have tried to, I guess, buy in some talent. Um, you know, I think a big part of the, the Faden story is that internal DNA. So, yeah. you know, how have we done it? You know, the US is obviously a huge, huge country. Um, you know, originally we pursued a pretty ge a regionalized strategy. So, you know, we focused on New York and then we moved up to, you know, San Fran on the West Coast, Boston in the Northeast, Charlotte, the Southeast. Um, as we're growing more now, that's probably more switching to a brand led strategy. So where are the verticals and niches that we want to grow? And we can deploy teams on the ground there, or we can also build teams in, you know, other locations and service that market part remotely or, or, or fully remote, basically. Yeah, definitely. So just to touch on something there, which is something that other clients have spoken to me about is kind of the DNA of an organization is so important uh, in terms of breeding that culture, scaling it up um, and having replicating success in other countries. Um, and I just uh, heard you say there that you relocated nine employees from the UK. Um, so I suppose how important is it that it you take your UK employees over first? And my second question is that is, what were you doing in the UK before you actually got those boots on the ground? Yeah, so um, I guess I'll start with what we were doing in the UK first. Yeah. So we, we basically set up a kind of shadow desk. So these guys, credit to them, were coming in at 1 p.m. UK time, leaving at midnight uh, and basically spending their entire day, you know, connecting with and working with clients and candidates in the US. We did that for about, sort of three and a half to four months. So again, yeah. you know, that was a Herculean effort from those guys to, you know, do those hours and do it. Um, but it was really important that we made that our US team, right? They they didn't talk to anyone else in the office. They were doing their own thing on their own time. Um, so yeah, we, we brought them out. Um, and then second part of the question or the first part, I've got confused again, what did you say? So I was just talking about, you know, how important it is to transfer your DNA from the yeah, UK so, to the US to start it off. Look, I think it, I think it depends on your business. For us, it was critically important because being all primarily organically grown, um, how we do things and how we develop people is part of the magic. I think if you have a business where you're leading more with a service offering, there's something you provide that is, is maybe more heavy on technology or is something that, you know, um, you can plug and play people into. Yeah. You can maybe go with fewer people and go, look, you know, let's get one person on the ground who understands what our offering is and then they can bring people in afterwards. Um, but from my side, you know, it's 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 also a lonely operation, right? Starting out, settling into a new city, building a business. I think if you can develop a, a team that can go together, um, I think it's going to help you. But you know, I think critical for us of you know of those guys that came, all of them are here apart from one, and I think that was a very deliberate process from us. We went through a number of interviews. We made sure that these guys not only worked well individually but together, because um, yeah. yeah, there is going to be highs and lows and people's life situations are going to change and mm -hmm. all sorts of things are going to come up. It's not as simple as going, you eight guys want to be in America. Here's a ticket <laughs> yeah. Yeah, first and it will be fine. We, we put a lot of thought into it. And again, that was learning from each time we've done things like Singapore and so on. But um, yeah, for us, like we will always try and have a core of people that are fading and wherever we go and expand, we always want to bring new people into that. But that that core is the one that helps everyone understand what it is, what our model is and how how we can scale the business and give them what we believe they should get from Faden, which is yeah. un unrivaled career potential, basically. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, okay, maybe if you could just share with us what you would determine as some of the biggest successes you've had in this market to date. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, a lot, obviously, the, the results we've achieved have been incredible. You know, I think we've grown 75% plus compound annual growth year on year. Um, you know, probably the biggest thing for me is we've been able to retain a huge amount of people through that growth. So again, to, to the guys that have ended up leading offices or leading brands for us that have come through being hired as someone with limited experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I think another key is that we've been able to deploy 
in multiple cities and always end up being highly profitable and growth driven. We've never really had a location where it didn't quite pan out. And a lot of that speaks to the time and effort we put into who are we going to deploy? What goals are we going to set? What yeah. brands are we going to target? Um, so yeah, you know, touch wood, we haven't ever really had anything not work out. Um, but again, I think a big part of that has been how much we've invested in supporting the business as we got bigger. So to what I spoke about at the start, we, you know, you know, here's a phone, here's a computer, go work it out. Like we, we have, I think, you know, a 15 person talent acquisition team in the U S now we have a similar sized L and D team. All of our management are still highly involved in the coaching, developing and mentoring of graduates and sales leaders. We are a very hands on business. Like if you, if you work here, you'll be able to get advice and help from anyone. And I think that's been critical to us being able to not just scale a couple of times, but you know, every single year we've taken significant steps forward. Yeah. The biggest challenge I think for any business, which is why recruitment exists, is hiring and, and keeping staff. And I think that's been the most pleasing for me, both from our culture, the passion we put into it, but also the, the support functions we've built as we've scaled to make sure that, you know, being a manager at Faden today, you can hire a 10 person team within six months and your input into that is purely interviewing the people. Um, you know, that everyone else is around to help that happen as opposed to sort of being a another job on top of your day right. job of, of running your team, you know? Yeah, so you've almost created your own ecosystem to support your managers to thrive. Yeah, my, my dream one day is that I could hire someone having never met them, plonk them <laughs> down in whatever country and purely by the business we've created, they would grow a successful office of 50 people yeah. having never spoken to anyone of Faden. I think we're not there yet, but that's kind of the goal yeah. we all share of, you know, that's how good I think we can make this business where smart, motivated people, almost it's impossible to fail because the, the structures and the support around yeah. them just are organic and there all the time as opposed yeah. to something they have to ask for, basically. Yeah, totally. It's that kind of, you know, the processes that you've got, the structure um, and the support. It's having that in place where you can scale it and replicate it and just spearhead your growth. Um, because those kinds of things in place are assets in the same way people are assets. Um, so yeah, I can totally uh, understand what just thinking about it. What would you say are some of the biggest differences you found in the US market compared to the UK? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot I, I can quickly touch on the obvious ones, right? Just in terms of size and scale, right? You can look at a map and you can see America is, is a big <laughs> country. Um, yeah. You know, 50 states, some of those states are bigger than multiple European countries combined. You know, anyone with Google can, can work that stuff out. I think other things that, that are beneficial, it's a single language, single business language, um, you know, relatively standardized legal system. There's some variation by states, but yeah. once you learn how to run the business, you can sort of replicate your, your model elsewhere. Probably the, the other thing that is pretty obvious as well, just the scale of the, the industries and the companies here, right? So if you take the equivalent business, you know, in, in Europe, the HQ there might be 500, 1,000 people. The equivalent office here might be three, four, five times as large. But also in any sector you look at, the number of companies operating in the US in that sector is just going to be a multitude of, of what yeah. you see. So, you know, the opportunity is big, but then I think it's okay, what what else is good about it? And then what are the challenges? So the other things that I think I really enjoyed seeing here was the perception of the, the service industry in the US versus yeah. Europe and the UK. Um, you know, you have to be good at what you do. Don't get me wrong. If you're providing staff or anything else in the service industry in the US, but if you do demonstrate that you add value rather than being viewed as a transaction cost, you can build genuine long-term relationships here. And I think more pleasingly, clients and candidates are willing to, in terms of clients, you know, pay you and pay you well. And in terms of candidates, yes. show that loyalty. And, and having come from the UK market where every percentage point on a term was a battle and, and, and sort of if you said you're a recruiter at a dinner party, you know, people would, would look yeah. the other way to a degree. Um, <laughs> it was lovely to come here and people were like, oh, that's great. You guys do staffing, you provide people, you know, it's just a, a refreshing outlook on life. But I think, you know, again, the caveat there is, you know, people will buy it once or twice, but if you don't deliver after that, then it kind of, you know, sounds a bit hollow. And I think that's where we, we really worked hard to make sure that we, we didn't just promise a good service, but delivered it every time. And I think the final thing for me that, that I found really refreshing was the attitude of people. Um, you know, I think, and I'm probably generalizing a lot here, I think a lot of people in the US want to be successful. That might sound really obvious, but you know, they, whether it's school, whether it's sports, whatever, there's quite a lot of in competition built into sort of the US academic and social structures. And I think people 
coming out of school here are a bit more mature and a bit more focused around what they want to be as an individual. Um, and the other thing is when you talk to them about success and you show them success, they're excited by it. I think sometimes in the UK, people can be a little bit cynical, a little bit yeah. negative and, and maybe want to pull you down the ladder rather than push you up. And yeah. again, not just in terms of people we hire, but just people you work with, you, you, yeah, you know, and again, massive stereotype, but you just, you feel a bit more energized here by, by what people want to do for themselves, which is just a great start point if you want to, if you want to work with them, basically. Yeah, totally. I can totally see that. I think a lot of um, clients I've spoken to have said the UK is quite a transactional market where actually once you've broke into the US market, you've got your clients, they're genuine lasting relationships and clients are a little bit more stickier than what you typically find in the UK. And as you say, willing to pay a lot more for your services. Yeah, I think, you know, again, I mean, you know, they will pay a lot more. And I think there's there's that balance though. What company do you want to be, right? You you could go out and you could probably charge people a lot of money, but you know, people have memories. And I think again, if you're thinking of being in this market, what do you want to be? Do you want to be the company that gets away with charging the highest fees and then get away with the whole time? Or do you want to be a company that is there through, you know, good times and bad times and offers a great fair price yeah. service? You know, there's a million different ways to make money here in the US yeah. market. I think, you know it isn't just about delivering good talent. I think it's about, you know, how you guys operate as a company, the, the, the morals, the ethics you have, the commitment you have to markets. You know, I think it's easy again to, to send some resumes and, and do fees every now and then, but are you going to be there in five years and are you going to be a better provider in five years than you are today? Um, and again, I think that's what a lot of what I see. I think people view the US as a, you know, salaries are high, fees are high, good recruitment market. And that is, I guess, true. But if you want to build a genuinely long lasting successful business. I think you have to think a little bit more strategically than that around actually who are you and who are you going to be for candidates and clients in the market in the long term rather than like how can I get excited about yeah. Yeah. some low hanging straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. I know we've spoken a lot about the successes. I know um sounds all great. Um but are there has there ever you know been a failure or a mistake that you you want to share with us that others could learn from? Um, so, I mean, on, honestly, like in my career, I think probably the biggest challenge I personally had was was the Swiss market, and that was before I did the US. Uh, we launched an office there. We we still operate there, but for me personally, that was eye opening around probably the only market where my recruitment philosophy and and maybe how I approached dealing with people really didn't land well, and uh, it was it was a really tough market for me to operate. A lot of how I thought about success and recruitment was different. So that was that was a real learning lesson for me um, about just, you know, how important it is to understand, you know, culturally the markets you're going into as well as what your your model is. Um, if I look to the US and the rest of it, like, as I said before, touch wood, we haven't had any glaring errors. I think the biggest thing that we haven't done in the past that I think we really are doing now is is trying to tell Faden's story a bit more. Um, we have been a very insular business, kind of deliberately so. We've just been working hard and focusing on what we do. Again, 90 plus percent of everyone we've hired has kind of started as a as a trainee entry level sort of person. Yeah. And I think that was right for us. But we're now at a point now with the, you know, the, the the reach we have, the platform we have, the brands we have, where I believe we can offer a great career path for people in the industry who are maybe working somewhere else, managing a small team, maybe working somewhere where, you know, it's a great company, but they don't have the reach we have. So I think we've missed an opportunity in previous years to do more of that. And I think going forward, we really want to be still an organically organic business first, but augment that with, you know, people coming in from other businesses who can, I think, take what they've learned there, but then learn from us as well and really be part of a business where, again, it isn't just about being a recruiter or a team leader. It is about building a career and building a brand and joining a place where we have plenty of evidence that that's been done. And you can learn from people who've done it rather than sit where you are and go, I'd love to do it, but I don't know how because no one, no one around me is showing it. So that's just an opportunity that I think we can, we can take advantage of. But yeah, honestly, touch wood. I mean, you know, there's obviously little things you, you you mess up along the way, but nothing that I would pick out and go, that was a real error that we that yeah. we made. Brilliant. Um, obviously, you're in New York. So, what's life like living in New York? Cause you've been there for a few years now. Yeah, I've been here what six ish years. So, um, yeah, I mean, honestly, unbelievable. Like, I think you know, uh, we lived in Manhattan for the first couple of years, then we moved to to, to Brooklyn. Um, you know, I've, I've lived in Hong Kong, I lived in London, and I've lived in New York. I think New York's probably the only place where I used to walk to the office in the morning and be like 6.50, 7 a.m. and you sort of feel like stuff was about to happen. I didn't know what and I didn't know where, but it was just, yeah, it was an exciting feeling. And I think obviously the pandemic put a bit of a 
a slow <laughs> dampener on that. But um, yeah, New York's obviously New York, right? Everyone's seen it in films and movies, whatever. And, and you know, I do think it's an amazing place. But having set up offices across the US and, and traveled a lot now with my family and my wife, the US again has so much to offer. You know, there, there's a lot of different large cities, there's a lot of different yeah. medium to small size cities that are becoming more popular. You know, I think your money can go a long way if you if you live outside some of the larger cities. Yeah. I think the, the quality of life and the things you can do outside of work are exponentially bigger here. And again, you know, even if you think about, you know, going on holiday in the US, right? There, there's that thing of, I think, 30, 40% of US people don't have a passport. And yeah. we, all, we all like to laugh at that. But having lived here, I'm like, I get it. You, you wouldn't necessarily need one, right? There are yeah. so many things to see and do and, and so much opportunity that, yeah, moving to the US for me was just an amazing decision. I think, you know, everything we've achieved on the professional front makes it even better. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's a great place to live. Um, there is something for everyone here. And again, I think if you are, you know, a committed, motivated individual who really wants to build a successful career, this is, yeah, a country and a place where that is eminently possible, yeah. Yeah, amazing. So what's, what's the main focus in the year ahead for Fader? Uh, so it doesn't really change from prior years, I guess. Uh, you know, the, the primary thing for us is, you know, we do want to be the number one provider in every single niche, in yeah. every brand we operate. So really, most of my job is, again, still looking at scale, right? So we have geographical scale. We've got a Tampa office, which is launching in uh, September of this year. Mm -hmm. So we'll have our first kind of Florida destination. We have three or four other places lined up for 2023 and 2024. Beyond that, we have our scale around our brand. So, you know, different brands are at different points of evolution for us. Selby Jennings is our largest brand, but there's still verticals there that we want to expand. Uh, we have Glowcoms, LBI, other businesses that are going through. So, as always, it is about organically scaling our business in either verticals or geographies where we think there is a genuine need from clients and candidates, but also a genuine possibility that we can be perceived as the number one provider without question for the talent we do and i think what's exciting for me is the bigger we get the easier it is to make that statement right we have you know in some verticals teams of 60 70 people operating across the us the reach we can provide candidates and clients in terms yeah. of opportunity is just almost unfathomable you know when i started mm -hmm. out you know there's a handful of you that there's only so much of the market you can actually access so that's the exciting bit and i think the other bit is you know like i was touching on i think telling our story a bit more to the rest of the world i i, I think we need to be more proud of what we achieved. And I think we need to tell more people about what we're looking to do. Um, and then the final bit is just, again, you know, people are the, the core of what we do. So making sure that we continue to look at how we onboard, how we train, how we develop people. Um, we're improving and adding to our management and leadership uh, in-house training modules as we get bigger, that's becoming more key. Um, it's always just about, yeah, how can we stick to our values, stick to our model, but always add just that one or 2% more around helping people learn quicker, do the job easier and there's again giving people opportunities to have do what i did you know put their hand up and say i'd like to go and launch this office or i'd like to be part of this brand yeah. launch i think that that has always been part of who we are and that's just what i spend 99 percent of my time trying to think and plan out and, and kind of put in front of people basically yeah brilliant so we're nearing the end so only a, a few more points left that i want to just explore with you loads of clients one of the main questions they always ask is what state should we focus on or what state should we open an office and obviously you've looked at a few states so the obvious is always new york california or texas and um, so avoid from saying one of those yeah, yeah, yeah. If, <laughs> if after those three what would you say are the up and coming states the ones to watch that people might want to explore so, so look to be honest you know, I, get, I think they're all up and coming, right? Like, I mean, maybe you could dismiss sort of South Dakota, North Dakota, maybe <laughs> Hawaii to a degree. But, um, you know, the, the biggest question I think people need to ask themselves is, you know, if you're going to be launching a business, who's going to be doing it, right? You know, if it's yourself or it's someone who works for you, who is this person? What kind of life do they have? And you guys need to go and do your research, right? Because you can have uh, everything New York has to offer, but there's a trade-off with that. You could go to, you know, uh, Again, Florida is is a place that has a totally different type of lifestyle, but is that really close to your markets? Does being close to your markets matter? The biggest thing for me, I would say, is you know whoever's going to build a business in the U.S. is going to be working really hard and going to be spending a lot of time trying to grow and source. So you need to be absolutely sure that they're happy, that yeah. it's somewhere where they can see themselves for at least five years, and that also it's somewhere where you can access 
whatever it is that you need to grow your business. If that's uh, tech talent, you probably need to be closer to some big cities. If it's graduate talent, you've got to think about where the colleges are and what those colleges yeah. uh, produce for people. Um, my advice to people would be, you know, probably do do as much research as you can get away with. You know, if you can come over, if you can go to different cities, you know, when I went to Charlotte, I was kind of amazed at, in a way, how small Charlotte city center was, but then right. how much business actually is in Charlotte and, and the North Carolina region, right? So you can't just look at a map or look at house prices or, you know, sort of <laughs> look at the deals you've done it is one of those ones where if you get on the ground i think the pandemic has dislocated a lot of stuff right and that that presents opportunities so you know yeah you could pick with the three that we started at the start they're all pretty simple picks you could then go for the next largest states by gdp that could be sensible i yeah. think there's an opportunity now for people to go let's go and see let's go and see where we want to be as a business and be as people and then see if it's viable to grow a business off the back of that and that could have you end up in probably 35 to 40 of the, the 50 states that are in the US. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Last one now. So um for anyone who's watching or listening, what would be the main tips or pointers that you would give to recruitment founders who are thinking of expanding to the US? Um yeah, so I think that there's a, a few few different things, right? I think the first question to ask is why do you want to be here, right? I, I don't think uh everyone's probably heard how great the market is and how well it's going and all this sort of stuff. But, you know, are you here for the long term, right? Are you just trying to catch, you know, a good market and sort of make some money? Or, you know, do you want to build a business in the US? And if so, what business do you want to build? Do you want to build a single location, single brand offering, multi-location? I think you need to answer all of those questions before you launch rather than sort of launch and work it out along the way, yeah. because that is going to impact how you can scale when you're on the ground. So again, I would really advise people not to go, everyone's making money. I better join them because otherwise I miss the boat. Um, the other thing I think people need to understand about here is there is a lot of positives to the market like we spoke about. There are some some realities to it, right? It's a relatively expensive place to operate a business, um, whether it's staff, resources, all of this stuff. It's relatively complex once you work across multi-state. It's certainly yeah. in contract, but even just as a business, yeah. um, it requires a lot of attention. You can't just you know, send some clients some invoices and, and then expect it to be paid back. There, there is a lot that someone is going to have to think about day in, day out beyond the recruitment side. Um, and I think the other thing as well is how much are you willing to reinvest in it? Because if you're viewing this as a, a dot on a map that's going to support funding businesses elsewhere, you know, that's a different model to it's going to be the first of many offices in the US for this strategic purpose. So, you know, I, I see a lot of people come to the US in the you know the six, seven years I've been here. Um, very few have actually really scaled businesses beyond sort of 50 to 100 people. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's not because they didn't want to. I think it's because it's actually way harder than it looks. So key for me would be, you know, why do you really want to be here and answering that question? And then the second bit is who's going to come here and do it? Because it is incredibly hard work. It's probably harder than ever before in terms of the level of competition, the competition for talent. Um, it is going to be something that consumes someone's life for at least three to five years, hopefully in a yeah. positive way. So, you know, and again, every dollar you make, you've got to be thinking, how much of that am I willing to put back into this? And how much of that did I actually want to use for something else? And I think too often people don't think about that. And again, one of the things I say is, you know, if you don't have a clear purpose and culture, I think people in the US buy into that a lot. And if it starts to become a bit unclear and unsure, people have options and they will you know, they value their career. They'll walk out the yeah. door and go somewhere else if they're not sure that what you promised when they joined is going to be what's going to happen in a couple yeah. of years. So it's a wonderful place. I've, I've usually positive things to say about it, but it isn't just this miracle place where the streets are lined to gold. It requires a lot of purpose, a lot of planning and a lot of commitment. Um, and I think beyond that, it, it you know, if you really want to be here in five, 10 years, you're going to have to think beyond just who you start with. You're gonna to have to work out how you can become an American staffing firm in the American market, as opposed to a you know, UK or European staffing firm with an office in the US, because they are two very different different questions and things to try and, try and achieve. Brilliant. Kieran, thank you so much for your time today. It's been so yeah. insightful, uh, and I know our viewers and listeners are gonna absolutely eat this up. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we love working with you guys and really excited to see kind of just where you take the business, not just this year, but obviously uh, there's no end point. So just on we're going throughout yes, the future. Exactly. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Thanks. no, and thank you, Amy. Obviously, we've we, we partnered with PGC for, for since inception, and you guys have been awesome. And yeah, hopefully, I've said a few things that, that interest people. And, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. So if anyone sees this and wants to connect further, then, then do reach out. But um, yeah, and I, we'll keep you up to date on how we're doing and, and, and where we get to in the next few years. Brilliant. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Amy.